Welcome to ECE 461 Control Systems, lecture number 11, first and second order approximations. Now, in the previous lecture, we looked at how to find the step response and impulse response for a transfer function. That gets really unwieldy when you start getting your 8th, 9th, 10th order systems. That actually can happen. The Maverick missile, for example, was modeled as a 250th order system. I don't really want to find the step response of a 250th order system by hand. Plus, you lose all intuition. If I look at this transfer function and said, by inspection, what's the step response? I really have no idea. So, there's a trick. When you have a dynamic system, there's a few poles that really dominate the response. Those are the dominant poles. What I'd like to do is take this system and come up with a model which is simpler but still fairly accurate, and he has a similar step response. Keeping the same dominant pole does that. So the concept of what a dominant pole is. For most systems, there's one or two poles that tend to really dominate the response of a system. For example, with my car, as you're going down the road, there's vibration modes, twisting modes, a lot of rattling. All of those are poles. The lump mass of the car really dominates the response, however. So if I just model that one pole, the lump mass, I'd have a pretty good model for the system. And that's really the purpose of modeling. How do we come up with a mathematical model which is simple, meaning useful, but still fairly accurate? The idea is if I match the dominant pole and I match the DC gain, I've got a model that's you know really pretty good, you know, 80, 85% correct, plus it's manageable. If I want to get a more accurate model, that's where you throw it, throw it into a computer simulation or MATLAB. So a couple definitions to start out. The dominant pole is the pole that dominates the response, which is kind of a tautology. It's, if you look at the step response, there's the overall response that uh, really dictates how it behaves. That's the dominant pole. Usually it's the pole closest to the origin. Not always, but usually. The transfer function is the differential equation that relates the input and the output. The DC gain is the gain at DC at s equals zero. The 2% settling time is if you have a differential equation, it'll respond and in theory takes an infinite time to settle out. Infinity is not a terribly easy number to use. So what I do is come up with a way of saying, as soon as I get close to zero, I'll call that the settling time. And to define close, that's kind of arbitrary. Typically 2% settling time is used. The reason being is 2% has got a nice logarithm. The log of 0.02 is minus four. So back in the days of slide rules, uh, logarithms were painful to use. So they use something that has got a nice logarithm and that standard is stuck. Overshoot, if I have a step response, it's how much it overshoots. Sometimes that's really important. For example, if I want to have an egg polisher, I want to have no overshoot because I'll crack the egg. If your car hits a pothole, you want it to bounce about three times for about 30% overshoot. Typically when you specify how the system should behave, you specify the overshoot and the settling time. Uh, from that, I've got to translate it to control systems terms. The damping ratio is the angle of the pole. Cosine of the angle is your zeta, the damping ratio. Damping ratio tells you the overshoot. Uh, so, if I have a system, I've got to figure out which one is the dominant pole. As I mentioned, it's the one closest to the origin, and you can see that here. Suppose I have three poles, one at minus one, minus 10, minus 100. Which one's dominant? Well, one way to do that is take the step response. I'll apply a step input, do your partial fraction expansion, and it says, here's your step response. The two is the forced response. That comes from my step input. These are the transients. And if you notice, this term of the transient, that first one, it really dominates. It starts out 10 times larger than anyone else, plus it lasts 10 times longer. So this is called the dominant pole. Almost invariably, it's the pole closest to s equals zero. The reason being is this input, this forcing function, excites these poles. The pole closest to it has the largest excite excitement, lar largest initial condition. And it decays the slowest, kind of give you a double whammy. The largest initial condition lasts the longest is the dominant pole. With that, I can do things and come up with a simplified model. If I were to say, this guy is too complicated, I want to simplify the model for my analysis. Well, if I keep the dominant pole, keep the DC gain, it's almost the same system. 
Uh, for example, the dominant pulls at minus 1. The DC gain here is 2. So this has the same DC gain, same dominant pull. It's almost the same system. And you can check that. Throw this in MATLAB, find the step response, I get the red curve. Find the step response to the first order system, I get the blue curve. And if you notice, the two are almost identical. There's a little bit of delay on the third order system. Sometimes they'll say it's the first order system plus a delay. That delay models all the pulls that I ignored. It takes into account that slight shift in there. Dominant pulls also work when you have complex pulls. For example, here I've got a fourth order system, or a fifth order actually. The pull close to the origin is this pull at minus one plus J2. If you have a complex pull in this class, you have to have its complex conjugate. So that's where you get a second order system. Uh, to come up with a model for it, keep the same dominant pull and match the DC gain. Um, so again, plug in S equals zero, find the gain, plug in S equals zero, the numerator is whatever it takes to make the T DC gains match. We get 4.507. Now take the two systems, find the step response. Here's the fifth order system in red, the second order systems in blue, and notice they're almost the same. I've got the same DC gain, same overshoot, same frequency of oscillation. Uh, there's a slight delay in the fifth order system. The second order system doesn't model, um, but it's pretty close. When you get more accurate, I could say second order system plus a delay. Kind of a sidelight. In this class, most of the systems we're looking at, like these guys, have a dominant pull right around minus one. The reason for that, it makes the math a lot easier. One's got nice numerical properties. One squared is one, one cubed is one, one to the fourth is one. Um, and what that kind of implies is time scaling. If my pull is not at minus one, so it pulls at minus a thousand. If I time scale it so that my x axis instead of being seconds is milliseconds, now the dominant pulls at minus one. So if you see all your systems having pulls near minus one at this class, that kind of assumes time scaling. If I'm talking about economies where it takes months for the economy to, to uh, settle out, my time unit might be months or years. If it's something quicker, my time unit might be milliseconds. Uh, regardless, typically the dominant pulls right around one, whatever your time unit is, at least in this class. Um, again, okay, that's just kind of a sidelight. So let's go on with first and second order approximations. Since I've got dominant pulls, you typically have either a real dominant pull or a complex dominant pull. If it's a real dominant pull, I'll just have a single dominant pull. If you have a first order system, say a single dominant pull, there's really only two degrees of freedom. A generic first order systems can be written in the form of A over S plus B. If I can tell you two things about the system, I can tell you what the system is. I've only got two degrees of freedom. One piece of information is the DC gain. Plug in S equals zero, I get A over B. Second piece of information is the settling time. This decays is E to the minus BT. Uh, for that to decay down to 0.02, that's the 2% settling time, take the log of both sides, log of 0.02 is minus 4, actually minus 3.97, close to minus 4. Solve for t, I get the settling time is 4 over the pole. Or conversely, the pole is 4 over the settling time. So that means by inspection, if I know where the pole is, I know what the settling time is. As an example, here's a 10th order system. Again, finding the inverse Laplace transform by hand is going to be really, really painful. I don't have to do that. If I take the system, plug in S equals zero, I get a DC gain of one. That's one piece of information. Factor this, I get 10 poles. The dominant pole is right here, the one closest to zero. The dominant pole is at 0.02, meaning the settling time is four of your pole, 179 seconds. And if you take the step response, sure enough, that's what you get. The DC gain is one, and the settling time is right around here. 179 seconds. So again, by inspection, I can look at the system and tell you what the step response is. I can also go backwards. Given the step response, what's the system? Again, DC gain is one, settling time is 179 seconds, give or take. It's hard to be real accurate with a graph. Which means that the pole is at 0.02, 
and the numerator is whatever it takes to make the DC gain 1. And notice when you take the go backwards, what you capture is the dominant pole. The other poles are really hard to see. Uh, they are there. The other poles are right here, that information. Really hard to pick out. Usually just get the dominant pole, hence the name dominant. That's for a single pole. If I have a complex pole, I'll also have a complex conjugate, and I'll have a second order system, or second order approximations. For a second order system, there's a couple ways to write it. I've got three unknowns, three parameters, however you do it. So if I could pull three pieces of information off a graph, I can tell you what the system is. Uh, the, at plug in s equals zero, that gives you the DC gain. In this case, it's going to be A. If I look at the real part of the pole, that's a decaying exponential. The real part tells you the 2% settling time. The complex part of the pole, omega d, tells you the frequency of oscillation. So if I can tell you the settling time, I can tell you the frequency of oscillation, I can tell you the DC gain, I can tell you what the system is. For example, for this system, the DC gain is 0.5. The real part is minus 2, so the settling time is 4 over 2, 2 seconds. And the frequency of oscillation is 20 radians per second, about 3 hertz. Another way to write it is in polar form. If I write the poles in polar form, multiply it out, I get s squared plus 2 zeta omega naught plus omega n squared. Omega n is the amplitude of the pole. Uh, zeta is cosine of the angle. It's called the damping ratio. The damping ratio tells you the overshoot. That's kind of important. A lot of times in control systems, the overshoot is what I want to specify. For example, an egg polisher, battleship guns want to have no overshoot. Um, a jet engine has a damping ratio of 0.8, 2% overshoot. When I do throttle forward, the engine can speed up a little bit, have about 2% overshoot, then settle out. On a car, I want to have three oscillations, meaning right around 50% overshoot. Depending upon the system, I specify the overshoot. The overshoot tells you the damping ratio. The damping ratio tells you the angle. Um, for example, suppose I had this system. I want to sketch the step response. Can the trick is find the dominant pole. That's right here, minus 1 plus j2. The settling time will be 4 over the real part, 4 seconds. The frequency of oscillation is 2 radians per second. The angle of the pole, the angle is 63 degrees. Cosine of the angle is your damping ratio, 0.44. The overshoot is 20%. So the step response looks like this. And I can also go backwards, given the step response, find the transfer function. Given the step response, the DC gain is 0.94. The 2% settling time is about 4 seconds. And the overshoot is 20%. 20% uh, overshoot tells you zeta is 0.45, tells you the angle. And if I know the real part, I know the angle, I can tell the complex part using some trig. So there's my system. Pick A to match the DC gain and you got your system. And notice again, I just picked out the dominant pole. The other poles are really hard to see. There's a summary. If you go on Bison Academy, there is a summary of second order systems. What that looks like is this. Uh, this graph right here is the step response versus damping ratio. So damping ratio of one, you've got no overshoot. At point one, I've got about 70% overshoot. The angle is the damping ratio. Right here on the real axis, damping ratio is 1. And on the geomega axis, the damping ratio is 0. When you get to frequency domain, time and frequency are related. If I have a pole on the real axis, damping ratio is 1. The gain just drops off with the frequency. Uh, but with filters at 0.7, that's the maximally flat gain. Below that, I get Chebyshev filters. The equations for damping ratio, overshoot, time to peak, so on, or probably more useful, the thing I like using. On the homework sets and tests, you'll have this on the tests. I just use the table. If I have 20% overshoot, that means the damping ratio is between 0.4 and 0.5. Call it 0 0.45. It's actually 0 0.4559. If I have 10% overshoot, the damping ratio is between 0 0.6 and 0 0.5. It's actually about 0 0.61. 
using the table, I can translate overshoot to damping ratio. Uh, let's see what else. And when we get to body plots, I can also tell you damping ratio versus resonance. How much more resonance I can tolerate tells you what the poles are. But that will be towards the end of the semester. So that's lecture number 11 for ECE 461 control systems, first and second order approximations.